When I say morbidity, I'm talking about illness, long-term chronic illness. That is kidney failure, eye disease, peripheral vascular disease. That's leg problems with ulcers and uh, loose sensation in the feet, etc. Right? <coughs> this uh, bottom statistic here. In 2010, diabetes was the cause of 1% of all deaths in Singapore. It sounds like a very startling statistic, right? But actually, it's a very small number. Road accidents probably contribute more deaths in Singapore than this. But that's the problem with diabetes. What it doesn't tell you here is that most diabetic patients who want to live, they don't actually go and stop it, okay? You know, right? So it's a chronic disease, it's multifactorial, there's genetics, there's um, lifestyle, okay, and there's environmental factors. So the fact remains that it's going to be a major problem. Um, like I was saying, it's a major cause of <coughs> chronic disease. You see, two in five, stroke, <coughs> one in two heart attack victims, and one in three kidney failure. And that translates to possibly a doubling of costs in the next 40 years. Now, it's all again very nice statistics, but it doesn't hit you at home, right? Until you look at look at these numbers here, right? So because these are the things that really affect people. If you get a show, there's a good chance that you will be out of action. If you manage to make a partial full recovery, you take anything within six months to live, right? And if you don't make partial full recovery, you have permanent disability, or worse, you're a bit right? So that causes tremendous long-term mobility. Right? Heart attack, one in two, um, it's a major risk factor. Uh, most patients do not die of heart attack these days. Uh, it's a very good place to save the heart and uh, medications that you can take. But still, half of them will die better. Right? And diabetes affect um, what we call small vessels, small tiny vessels, not the big vessels, the small vessels. And because of that, it's quite hard to treat uh, what you call this small vessel disease or microvascular disease. Right? And kidney failure is, is the direct impact of this, right? Because your little blood vessels in your kidneys are damaged by diabetes, and you end up with kidney failure. Now, kidney failure is a multi decade problem, right? Because the kidney function goes slowly down, 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 until a point in time where you can't, you don't have any kidney fun function. So therefore, you need some form of kidney replacement therapy, and we know that as dialysis, right? Dialysis is a huge, huge burden, not just to the patients, but to, to families, to uh, governments, huge burden, because an average, well, I can show you later, an average um, kidney failure patient in a year gets admitted about seven times, an average kidney failure patient, on average, right? This is on top of the usual dialysis that we undergo. Just to give, I don't know if any of you are having, doing, doing hemodialysis or anything. Anybody hemodialysis, no? Anybody know somebody who's having hemodialysis? Okay, so they need dialysis three times a week, right? How much do you think it costs every single time to go? Seven hundred dollars. With, with the subsidies and everything, it's about hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars, depending on where you go, right? That's three times a week for the rest of your life. Okay, this is on top of <coughs> operations you need to create the fistula, the dialysis, all the potential complications you can get. But they still get complicated. I operate on one <coughs> glands and neck, called the parathyroid gland, for these. Um, you know, failure patients. So you can see over a lifetime of a patient with kidney failure, tremendous cost, tremendous cost. And I would dare say um, almost 90, 9 in 10 dialysis patients are on some form of social support. Well, we because it's just not, um, it's just such a huge burden uh, for the family and the patient. Okay, so. What about obesity? Now, a lot of people say that, uh, hey, uh, I'm not fat, so but why am I diabetic? This is a very interesting quote. I mean, uh, this is the area that I do most research in. In, in Asia, it's unique. Now, unlike in, in the West, where diabetes and, and 
uh, obesity is very closely linked, right? In Asia, it's not the case. Uh, I think it's probably a genetic uh, predisposition as well as some kind of environmental factors such as the kind of diet you have uh, that predisposes Asians to develop diabetes at the lower what we call glycemic threshold. It means to say that you become diabetic earlier than a person stay in the West. Okay. So, but we know that obesity is significantly associated with diabetes and something about this thing called insulin resistance. Now, um, our, our body produces this hormone called insulin. Whenever you eat, insulin is produced and it stimulates your cells, the rest of the cells in the body, the muscles, the, the rest of the peripheral organs to take up the sugar from the blood stream. Now, typically, humans uh, has evolved since their caveman days to be very efficient. Everything you put in your mouth is fully absorbed. Okay? There shouldn't be any leftover sugar or energy in, the, in, in your feces or passed out in your urine. Okay? But that's not the case with diabetes. Okay? In diabetes, you actually have a situation where you cannot store these sugars anymore and you lose them in your urine or in your feces. Right? Um, some of the earlier signs of diabetes, people notice is when you go to the toilet, they see a lot of ants at the toilet, right? So that's a sign of diabetes. And I just want to remind everybody, what you're talking about here is type 2 diabetes, which is diabetes that is uh, acquired in, in, in your life, during your life, as opposed to type 1 diabetes, is where it's a situation where you don't have the insulin uh, producing cells, right? So you inject yourself into insulin. So everything we talk about here is type 2 diabetes, right? Type 1 diabetes is treatable with insulin. But type 2 diabetes is treated in a variety of ways, right? The chief method is medications, right? Um, lifestyle medications play a big part, and I'll talk a little bit about surgical treatment for diabetes, right? And um, so these are solutions okay, uh, for this diabetic problem. Now, <coughs> How, how does weight affect uh, diabetes? So you can see that uh, if you start this is for you men and women, um, uh, you pretty much uh, increase your risk of diabetes as you put on more and more weight. This, this, this is called BMI, body mass. Right? So uh, if it's your weight in kilograms divided by the height of the man, and as you have a higher and higher BMI, your risk of uh, yeah, the impact to diabetes increases exponentially. Uh, so, but these studies are done in quite long ago, and these are done in, in Western populations. In Asia, the same graph would that we look at, right? The graph would go like that. So, at the lower BMI, you're going to get like that. So, the, the question then is for this group of these patients, which, who is the major contributor of Patients. Now, ironically, it's not the super obese. The super obese are these, these ones here, BMI 1 and 40. Right? So, just to give you a rough idea what is super obese, okay? Uh, on average, most people are between 1.6 to 1.8 years old. Say so 1.7, right? You have to be around 110, 120 kilograms of BMI. Just this rough age, right? So, if you are 120 kilos, and you are about my height, you know, then you know you are pretty obese. Right? Also, obese. <laughs> it's just a rough age. But you can see that it doesn't contribute a lot to all the diabetes. The, the, big, the big group of contributors to diabetes is actually the not so obese, right? People who are moderate, in 30 to 25. So, again, for the same height, we're talking about people in the 90 kilogram to 100 kilograms. So, what do we do about that? I mean, um, when you're obese, you have a whole bunch of problems. Okay, not just diabetes. Diabetes is the top problem you have. You can have uh, women endometrial cancer, men with gallbladder disease, knee problems because the knees have to carry more weight, right? Um, high blood pressure, being hard to work harder to pump blood around, heart disease, breast cancer, colon cancer. So diabetes, obesity is a problem. Okay, so you, you get what I'm coming to now. Obesity and diabetes are related. You treat obesity, you would not only treat diabetes, you treat a whole host of other problems. Okay. So, here's where I'm going to talk about surgery. 
because I'm a surgeon. <laughs> uh, a lot of diabetics are taking medications, which is fine. I, I think if you can portray a diabetes in a picture of lifestyle medication, well and good. But there's some there's a group of patients who would certainly benefit from surgery. Now, what kind of surgery are we talking about? We are talking about. Uh, well, I'm going to put it in what most of my relatives tell me: stapling the stomach. <laughs> it's actually you make your stomach smaller. Okay, and you short circuit your gut so that less of the food passes through your intestine. You know, so, so basically instead of the food going down your stomach, down your intestine and comes out of your body, we make your stomach smaller and we take part of your intestine and join up with your stomach so that it doesn't go through that much of your intestine. Okay. So sounds like a Sounds like a quite a drastic plan to, to treat diabetes. Well, the initial part for this type of, in, in, the initial intent for this kind of surgery wasn't for diabetes at all. It was for weight loss. It was to treat morbidly obese patients. This kind of surgery is called geriatric surgery. It's a health patient for morbidly obese. Um, however, the, uh, the surgeons have incidentally, incidentally uh, stumbled on a, a miraculous cure for diabetes. Because without us knowing it, when we did the surgery, we noticed that all the patients who were diabetic became non-diabetic. Yeah. And, and many years of research, we still haven't found you know, the cause, what, what's the underlying mechanism. It's like, we suddenly appeared in mass that we don't know how they got there. <laughs> that's, how, that's, how, that's how I see it. Um, it, it it's incredible. I want to show you the next slide, because at least I want numbers here. This is a slide from 10, now, now 15 years study. Sweden, the Swedish obesity study uh, looked at patients with diabetes, hypertension, and this thing called hyperuricemia as well. Um, and they compared patients who had surgery and patients who had diet control and tablets. Okay, and they followed that for 10 years, and this is what happened, right? Uh, two years, <coughs> uh, two years and 10 years, right? So the light blue arm is surgery, the blue, the dark blue arm is control. So, at two years, only 21% of patients with this error bar uh, were, were free of diabetes. And for, sur for surgery patients, 72 And in 10 years, that number went down even more. And by this half, without, but you still have more than 50% of that original group of patients who were free of diabetes. And this is without medication. This is just them leading their normal lives. Okay? Um, very effective, right? And we have shot an long-term data now. There's something called a randomized shot that's going on in the US and in Singapore to look at the effect of uh, this kind of surgery in the short and the long term for diabetic patients. So, if it's so effective, why don't all diabetics go for this surgery? Well, um, that's the problem. The problem is this. Um, it's not suitable for everybody. Right. Because in the first place, you have to be obese. Well, one of the mechanisms that we understand about this kind of surgery is that it works best on the patient for very obese and diabetic. Okay, if you're obese and you're diabetic, there's a good chance if you do this surgery, you achieve a durable remission of your diabetes in up to 10 years. Right? But if you're not so obese, is it useful? If you're not so obese and you're diabetic, is it useful? Well, like I said, that's the that's the, um, that's the subject of our study that we are carrying in Singapore today. Yeah. We are recruiting patients who are not diabetic, so not obese but diabetic, and you know, putting them in surgery or control arms, and then we see whether or not they have as good an effect of uh, diabetes remission. Uh, this data here is from another series, uh, like I said, more than 10 years ago, uh, that looked at 600 old patients, and we have consistent results, which is almost 80% of patients who have some kind of diabetic conditions. Another one, we looked at uh, meta-analysis, we pulled all the patients, you know, uh, almost a thousand more patients, and again, the, the results are similar. So, uh, I don't want to keep going on about this, but um, there is a solution to diabetes. Okay? Like I said earlier, everybody knows that there's a problem, but very few people talk about the solutions. Now, the solutions, this is one of them. If you are obese, and you are diabetic, this is the best solution. If you are not obese and you are diabetic, then a combination of medications 
lifestyle therapy uh, would help. And if you happen to, I always tell my, my friends this, and this happens a lot during Chinese New Year. If you are borderline obese and you're diabetic during Chinese New Year, please eat a bit more. Because you get past the threshold, I can offer you so. <laughs> <laughs> But this is in contrast to what you see on TV, right? So, so this year, the Health Promotion Board has decided to, to launch a very nice uh, uh, Uxia, you know, kind of movie about sugar control. Now, how many of you, how many of you ate half of the fiber parts this year? <laughs> One. Okay. Right. And how many of you um, decided that I'm going to make a Chinese New Year resolution and eat less sugar? <laughs> One, two, okay, <coughs> two, three, okay, you know what I mean, it's, here's, here's the problem with diabetes, okay, and people, like what Kapal said earlier, such a, it's like a planet, you can't move it, right, and the reason is, the planet is not in, in a disease, or uh, something out there, or the problem, the treatments are no good, the planet is with our own cultural and personal beliefs, right, it's very, very, very hard to change a person's habits, especially dietary habits, it's extremely difficult. You know, if I ask everybody to halve their caloric intake today, I guarantee you, all of you will be miserable. Yeah. Right? So, so, because of that, it's very hard to change that. Okay? And as, uh, as doctors, we always tell the patients the same thing, which is, um, you know, make the right food choices. <coughs> You don't have to ask me how you make the right food choices. Go to the PPD website, Health Promotion Board. They will tell you exactly what to eat. Okay? You know, more grains, less rice. Or, you know, uh, more greens, less carbohydrates and fats. Um, of course, it's obvious. Everybody knows that you have to do that, but it's not easy to change, right? So, what's the solution then? I mean, we we, we all know the answer, but we don't want to change. So there are a few ways to look at it. I'm just going to skip this and talk about this now. So I, earlier I mentioned about predictive analytics, correct? So what's this got to do with what I just said? Okay. This is what it is. Not all of us would uniformly develop diabetes, right? So you may eat more than me, but I get diabetes. Why? No, right? Maybe again, combination of genetics, environment, etc. Right? And and the converse could be true. So the question now is who should we target for uh, better, more intensive uh, preventative measures and therapies to prevent the person from getting diabetes? Okay? Again, if I ask the room now, anybody know that they have a family history of diabetes? I'm going to put my hand up. I have a family history of diabetes. Anybody else? One, two, over there, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. The question is, if you have a family history of diabetes, what have you done for that? <coughs> That's the question, right? And for the rest of us who do not have a family history, am I likely to develop diabetes? So that's the question. Nobody knows the answer. There isn't a blood test I can just take today and say that, oh yeah, for sure, in five years you get blood, you get diabetes. Now, but that's changing. Why? Because we have data. We have a lot of data. We have data that goes 10 years, right? Singapore is, is unique in the sense that we have electronic medical records for now almost 15 years, okay? We are not totally complete for 15 years, but we do have enough data to piece together and make analysis and models of these uh, groups of patients with diabetes and predict who will get diabetes, and of the people who will get diabetes, who will have problems and who will have complications. Okay? So that's what we can do now. And we use tools such as machine learning, deep learning, to help us do these kind of predictions. Um, I just want to show you one. This is a group that I work with uh, with Illinois. Uh, we came up with a tool called Single Dragon. It is a tool specific to predict um, diabetic surgical patients who and how likely are they to be readmitted? Okay. Um, this, was, this was the problem that I gave to the engineers. But of course, the two can be generalized into any other diabetic condition. Right? So, how does it work? So, we take one patient, and you can see down here, this is 2001, so more than 
more than 10 years, right? So it's about 15 years, all the way to 2012. This is one diabetic patient, okay? The blue refers, every blue dot here refers to one medical condition, and every stream of dots refers to one admission, okay? The red dots refer to what we call 30 day readmissions. In other words, they got readmitted to the hospital within 30 days of them being in the hospital for similar or different conditions. So you can see that this patient, in, the, in almost, a, okay, this is 2012, in almost a 10 year period, had about 25 conditions. Okay? And they were for all sorts of different things, but they all, quite a lot of them are diabetic. But what we were interested in are the 30-day reactions. This lot, this lot, this lot, that, this bunch here, and that one there. Why? The reason was to prevent these reactions. Can we come up with predictive factors to tell us what factors might have predicated his readmission to the hospital and could we have prevented it? So if you look at this one patient, right? If you look at this patient who came in here, 30-day reaction with what we call polyneuropathy, fully controlled hypertension and hyperlipidemia. So these are related to diabetic uh, patients. Okay? And we look at so-called the precursor events, these precursor admissions. Could we have, in this patient, predicted that if he came in with these, like diverticulosis, could we have predicted that he would be coming, he would be coming in in the next two months uh, with all these conditions? That's, that's, that's the challenge, right? So this is just one patient. Now if you overlay this with 10,000 patients, 100,000 patients, and suddenly you can build a model. You can build a model that says that, okay, if you are between 50 and 55, diabetic, if you came to the hospital with diverticulosis and maybe uh, central vein retinal occlusion, there's a good chance that you'll be readmitted in the next 30 years. And therefore, I will intervene in you, which is, I will ensure that all your problems are solved, the diabetes is well controlled, I'll send a nurse to your house in one week's time after your discharge to make sure that the diabetes is under control. Right? So that's what we're trying to do with these models. These models give us predictive capabilities to prevent and preempt conditions. And there's nothing to say that with more data we can't predict people who are well. Right? So we take all the diabetic patients right, who are well, we look at all their conditions, all their comorbid factors, and then we compare them with another group of patients who are also well, but have other medical problems. And then we can see very clearly that, hang on, these diabetic patients seem to have a certain pattern. Right? And from that pattern, and if you came to me down to a single individual, every single Singaporean, I can tell you that, okay, this is your chance of developing that. So this is what we can do with when you have a lot of data, right? So, so how does it work? So we take the diagnosis, we put it in the engine, and now comes the likelihood, likely things that you might come in for. And what we do then is we say, okay, you have diabetes and you are anemic. Then there's a likelihood that you might develop hypertension, heart failure, right? Or anemia. Okay. So that's what these tools can do for us in the future. So this has been published. We, we put it up for a paper last December in Shanghai. And um, what we want to do moving on from here is to expand uh, these kind of tools to help us predict all kinds of diabetic conditions, uh, be it renal failure, be it eye disease, be it corporal vascular disease to tell the patients and the doctors that, look, I mean, you know, right now the doctor will say, okay, your blood test is not so good. Your, your, your what we call DBA1C, your glycemic index is eight. Okay, it's not very good. Here, take some medication, okay? I think in the future, it won't be that anymore. You came in, you say, look, we know that based on your individual characteristics, I can tell you that you have a 75% chance of your developing kidney failure in the next three years, okay? So therefore, I would like you to do two things. First, I'm going to give you a new medication to protect the kidneys. Right? Second, I would like you to ensure that you cut, you keep your glycemic index within the range, right, for the foreseeable future. And how you do it is this methods: take a medic, take a tablet, change your lifestyle, etc. 
Now, no longer is the patient thinking, oh, the doctor just said try. It is, my doctor is telling me that I have a four, three in four chance that I'll become a kidney failure in two years if I don't do this. Okay, so it's a very, very hard sort of evidence. And so far, we've tested these kind of tools on what we call um, uh, test, test cohorts. In other words, these tools have not seen these cohorts before. And they are 93% accurate. Okay, with the predictions. So, so we are going into a future where not only do we know that there's a problem, okay, on this chart that we saw, not only do we know that there are good solutions, we can now tell you who are going to have problems and how are they going to be affected by these problems. Right? So we are getting more and more targeted in what we do. And, and just to sort of wrap this whole thing up, I, I think that you know, diabetes on, on the whole is, is a long-term problem. We're not going to solve this problem next year. Not even the year after. It's going to be a problem that we can solve maybe in 10 years. Okay. The reason being, um, like we said earlier, it, it's, a, it's a behavioral thing. It's a behavioral cultural thing. Right. And moving forward, so I hope that we can use these tools to help us achieve the state where you reduce the mobility of diabetes right, to a level where it's socially and Economically viable for the country. I'll take questions. Thank you. Uh, will that be over treatment? No. When you say over treatment, you refer to? It means somebody who, who won't develop uh, diabetes if he keeps the same lifestyle, mm -hmm. but he predict that, that uh, he may have. So you give him some medicine? Uh, no. So generally speaking, right, these these tools do not advocate medications preemptively. But let's say you don't have anything wrong with you, and you still predict that okay, you've got a good chance of getting diabetes, then the two things that would be recommended is lifestyle change and exercise. That's that's quite true. Now that's what's the current recommendation. Um, we have we have some um, blood tests that we do, some what we call oral glucose tolerance tests to see whether or not you're borderline diabetic. So for the borderline diabetics and who have risk factors, that's what we recommend, exercise and diet change. So you don't need that medication. Right? Um, I, I don't foresee a day where you deliberately treat a patient with something that they don't already have. It's not like. But because your pattern is that you, you want to predict what's the chance of these people have uh, diabetes from some of other diseases that they may have. So you actually did this inference from non-diabetes disease to diabetes disease. So if somebody already has all the support to, for, for, for a rule, mm -hmm. then he, he may have developed that kind of disease, but he actually didn't have. So there is a, um, there is a problem of um, you may have to treat more than what you, what you should. Okay, let's just say that nobody <coughs> ever dies from having a bit more exercise and better diet. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I won't give a, a patient who is not diabetic uh, what you call oral hypoglycemic region because it's dangerous. You know, I mean, if you're not diabetic, I won't give you insulin for example. Uh, I mean, you don't generally give insulin in the first, in the first line. You give tablets. These tablets are called hypoglycemic regions. But generally speaking, we don't give these tablets until you develop diabetes. But the preventative measures are what I said so your, your predictive analysis is only for those who already have diabetes? No. Mm -hmm. Even those who do not have diabetes. You get what I mean? Let's say, let's say in this room, I say that okay, half of you might develop diabetes. So what's the recommendation? The recommendation is watch your diet, exercise, do a blood test maybe once a year to make sure that you don't miss out on the onset of diabetes. And that's it. I'm not asking you to start taking 10 tablets. Uh, you can target, target at each individual. Yeah. So for each individual, you know that he will have some chance to get diabetes, right? Yeah. So then, if your predictive analysis doesn't reach the amount of diabetes disease to diabetes, how do you actually do this predictive analysis? Okay, I, then I think maybe you want to rephrase the question. How do we make this prediction? Correct? 
I, I, I mentioned earlier that the money is 3% correct. Well, any kind of tool you use, predictive tools are just as good as any other mm. tools. Uh, they all have a certain level of accuracy. There's no tool that will tell you 100% correct, right? especially in medicine, biological systems. So these tools are accurate to a certain extent. So when we design these tools, we always design them to be what we call fault tolerant. In other words, we do not design them to make errors that will lead to a bad outcome. So I'll give you an example. One of the, one of the design thing features we build in these algorithms is that we tend to over predict and under predict. So because we, we don't want to miss a case, we are more likely to say that, okay, we accept that there's a 7% chance that these patients may not have diabetes or may never develop diabetes. We, we accept that. But on the trade-off that we will not miss anyone who will. You know what I mean? So that is the trade-off of these kind of things. But you must see the intervention. If the intervention is drastic, that means to say, I want to predict whether you get a heart attack in the next one hour. Now that's kind of that's the kind of prediction that I don't think any machine tool would be very good at doing. Because you're dealing with life and death. If you're wrong, somebody dies. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you're wrong about somebody developing diabetes in the next 10 years, it's okay. You can still give the patient the medication and the patient is fine. Correct? But if you're wrong that in an hour you will develop a heart attack and you miss it, somebody actually develops a heart attack and drops it, then this tool is very dangerous. And we'll never allow this tool to be, <coughs> to be used as it were. Okay? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I think that to, to put that in the correct term is it's what you call diabetic ulcers. Uh, it, it is because, like I mentioned many earlier, diabetes affects the, the vessel walls of small blood vessels. <coughs> Right? So these, when these small blood vessels are damaged, they get blood, they break down easily. And what happens is that these vessels, especially in your legs, right, the furthest away from the heart, um, are very easy to, to break down and therefore they form ulcers that don't heal very easily. And they are worsened by the fact that a lot of diabetic patients also have large vessel disease, okay, typically result of high blood pressure, uh, which causes reduced blood flow to these uh, non-healing ulcers and therefore make it even worse, harder to heal. So typically when we treat these patients, we make sure we treat the vascular problem, which is the blood flow problem. And we also treat things like we retain the blood a bit with medications, right? So that we allow the blood to flow to the areas where it repairs. It's, it's a humongous burden, tremendous burden that these ulcers walk around. Doctor, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very topical to me. I we learned it yesterday when Kerbal said we've got a session today on diabetes. Right. My question is, you've talked about getting diabetes. Mm -hmm. Is this such a situation where it's irreversible, or can it be reversible? And I'll share just a, a personal experience. My doctor a year ago, I've been 27 years in Singapore, my doctor, the same doctor, said you've got danger for diabetes, control your exercise, etc. Two weeks ago, I went to Myanmar, had a lot of sugary stuff, and my glucose index fell up to 380. Okay. In the last six days, simply by being very, very strict with my diet, it's down to 170. Right. So, is diabetes once you get it, because you said you get it, so can you clarify what you mean by <coughs> got it? Is it reversible by lifestyle change? Okay, so, so this is a very, very good and important question. Um, that there is an infection point, okay? It's not very clear where this point is, but mm -hmm. there is. Okay, so beyond which you, you are pretty much, you can't be cured of that, okay? okay? But there's a very long slope leading up to that, okay? And how does that work? So I'm just going to talk you through just what we understand in terms of the metabolism of diabetes. Now think of diabetes as this, okay? Our bodies are, okay, this is, take us back maybe 10,000 years, right? Starvation state is the norm, right? You have to hunt, kill a bison, and pick it up and quickly eat everything, and then you don't get any food for the next 10 days until you kill another hunt, right? So our bodies are built for starvation. We are built to take up everything and store it in your bodies. But in the modern era, we're no longer in the starvation state. We're three meals a day, right? And more. 
<laughs> right? Or five sometimes, right? And, but what happens to your body when a body in a starvation state is subject to continuous glucose or carbohydrate bombardment? They'll keep storing everything until you can't store it, right? Okay? So the first organ to get impacted by this excess is your liver. Because the liver is the first spot of call for all your sugar, right? And your liver is, acts as a reservoir to suck out all the sugars that you eat, right? And it metabolizes it, it stores it, okay, and then it distributes it. Make sure that the blood sugar, your blood sugar is always stable. But once you become diabetic, is when your, your liver is given up. I can't take any more of this sugar you're throwing at me, you know? Then what does it become? It becomes fatty. We call fatty liver. Anybody eat them for gram? <laughs> That's fatty liver. Okay, it's fatty goose liver. You force feed the goose, right? The liver turns fatty. And that's because the body is trying to store, the liver is trying to store the sugar in the most energy dense <coughs> form, which is fat. Okay? But in doing that, it damages the liver. Okay? Now, once your liver has cannot take this amount of sugar, it overflows into your system. Right? And what happens when you have high sugars in your blood? It damages your blood cells and the blood vessel walls, and it starts to damage the rest of your body, your eyes, your brain, your kidneys. So, and your peripheral organs, your muscles, all these, right? I'm trying to store this sugar, you know? I'm trying to take it in, but I can't take any more. And what happens? It prevents all that in the circulation, right? And causing a lot of damage. So, up to that point, right? It is still reversible. Okay? And your, your pancreas is, remember I talked about insulin earlier? Constantly secreting this hormone, insulin. Please store the sugar. We have lots of it. Keep storing, keep storing it. Go. Until one point, every other organ in the body decides, we had enough. Okay. I can't store anymore. Even if you tell me 100 times in a day to store this sugar, I can't store this sugar anymore. Then you develop something called insulin resistance. Okay. Which I talked about before. Right. So your body is resistant to this insulin anymore. Your insulin keeps going higher and higher and higher to a point where your insulin secreting cells, or the bigger cells, start to die. Because they, what, what am I doing? I'm just telling all these guys to take up the sugar, but nobody is listening to me. I'm not so strong. So they, 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 they undergo senescence, that means they, they die off. And then you become insulin dependent. So beyond a certain stage, you see people start injecting insulin, diabetics start injecting insulin, it means that their pancreas, the insulin secreting cells in pancreas are not functioning anymore. And they are dependent on insulin. So they have inject huge doses. I mean, one day my aunt is like that, she has to inject herself uh, three times a day. Every time is about 30 units. Now just to give you an idea, 30 units is one small teeny mini syringe. Yeah, okay? Your own body, a healthy individual, right? Does not even use a third of that amount of insulin, right? And the insulin-dependent diabetic at that stage, at the end stage, need ten times, okay? And it just and it just goes down here also. Right. So to answer your question, there's a very long walk up to that stage, right? I'm talking about years. And then once you reach the stage where your doctor starts telling you, look, your sugars are not controlled by any of the tablets, any of the lifestyle. You need insulin. You know that that's beyond the stage where I can cure you. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Yeah. How can how what are the signs of your liver having given up? So, for example, in my case, if I can bring my and I'm not looking for a personal consultation, sure. yeah. but if my insulin, if my uh, glucose comes down, does that mean my liver hasn't given up? Um, no, uh, I think the way to, to determine if your liver is turning fatty is a combination of blood test and, and an ultrasound show that very easily. Um, but fatty liver is reversible. Okay. It is still a re reversible state. So, like I said, you're, you're reversible until the point where you develop insulin dependence. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you this question, Doctor? Thank you for the lecture. Yeah. Can I ask you, is the person the person eating habit when they got babies, uh, formation, uh, is the habit will affect the child born when they grow up as an adult? Okay, uh, I just have to maybe rephrase your question. Uh, am I right to say that your normal, normal person eating habit does it affect the baby? Uh, 
when you grow up as an adult, if a mother eat a lot or eat a little bit, it will affect the teacher. Okay. So, uh, the answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. So there, there are two two things that can happen. So one thing that can happen is nothing to do with what the mom eats, but the fact that she has a predisposition for what I call gestational diabetes. In other words, mom develops diabetes during pregnancy, only during pregnancy. And there's some familiar genetic predisposition, predisposition for that. The impact on the child is that the baby will be big. And, and the gynecologist will ask you to deliver early. Right? Otherwise, the baby is too big, it can't come out. Okay? No, if the mother is normal mother, no diabetic one, if normal, normal mother. Yeah, coming to that. So the other the other thing about the other possibility is related to if you are not diabetic, you are normally eating just that you eat a lot, would that have an effect on the child? The answer is no. No chance that the child will be diabetic. But the converse is true. If the mother doesn't eat enough, yes. He has a negative impact on the child when the child is born. But eating more, no, no evidence yet. Mm. Yes, I saw your, your earlier graph. Yeah. It shows that the green is huge in both China and India. Yeah. They are saying they have a cooperation. So, what, what are they doing about it? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it is, if you think that we have a major problem, just multiply that factor by about. 150 times, then you get the size of the problem in China and in India. Now, in India, it's interesting because um, uh, even the high proportion of Indians are that okay, and, and we don't know the real cause, probably a genetic and also the kind of food in the dietary habits they have. Um, there, there's a piece of study by uh, this, this doctor, uh, Dr. Cummings in Columbia University, that looks specifically at Indians developing diabetes and he showed that at the lower weight threshold they develop diabetes. Yeah. So um, what are they doing about this? Not, not nothing as far as I know from the policy level. Um, the, the same things are being done as any other country which is based on medications. I don't even think that they have to watch your diet and pay. I mean it, it's a bit crafted <laughs> to it asking a you know, you go to a chapati shop and say, watch your diet, don't eat so much. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. So, so it, it is a major problem because, like I said, it, it, it touches on people's dietary habits and a lot of them are culturally driven habits. Also. But um, I'm sure, I don't know, our Indian friends here will eat later at night, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. At 9 p.m. Um, it, it does seem to have an impact because um, when you sleep, you digest all your food. Okay. And if you don't have any kind of activity in between, everything gets gets into the system. <laughs> and nothing is going. Okay? So uh, I think there's also some cultural factors that drive this uh, impact. For, for the China, it's a different story. It actually, it's a combination of not just the diabetes, but for China, the biggest problem is actually the diet is very heavy installed. And the biggest problem is, is actually hypertension. Which plays a part in that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this uh, blood test uh, is determined by the score six point five. No medication. Am I right? Okay. So let, let's be very clear, so that everybody knows in this room, uh, that there are two blood tests that most diabetics take. Okay. One is what we call blood sugar level. Okay. Uh, to make things more complicated, um, there, there are two units that we use. Uh, these refer to the American unit. Right, and then in Singapore we use what we call the most So the numbers are different. Okay? So that's your sugar level in the blood. Then there's another indicator called HbA1c or hemoglobin A1c. What is that? Um, hemoglobin A1c is basically it looks at your, your blood, red blood cells and it looks at how much of the surface of red blood cells has been uh, has sugar stuck on it. Okay, what we call glycated. So the proportion, the amount of sugar on, on it tells you how good the control was for the last three months. Why? Because every red blood cell has an average lifespan of about three months. Average. So when we take a glycated uh, hemoglobin level from you, we are looking at your how good you were in three months. <laughs> good blood, not good. <coughs> yeah, okay. yeah. So so the, the the number that we put is six point five for Glycated hemoglobin. Anything less is good. Anything within 6.5 to 8 
to about eight is average, more than eight is bad, more than ten is terrible. Okay? No, so I have achieved seven, uh -huh. and then doctors say the medication. Ah, so now, you must know which one you're talking about. Because the, the Singapore unit for sugar is also between four to eight. Not not glycated in the way. Blood sugar level. Okay, so everybody gets confused between blood sugar level mm -hmm. and glycated in the way. Okay, one tells you just the spot, I mean what, what is your sugar level now. The other tells you what's your control like over three months. Okay? So I take that what the doctor means is that you did a glycated in the way. Got less than seven, which is good, right? Therefore, you should just continue a lifestyle. Yeah, exercise and yeah. diet control. Yeah, like I said earlier, nobody dies from good lifestyle and exercise. <laughs> 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 so, what is the maximum the score? Can, can it be eight, nine, ten? Like in the hemoglobin? I've uh, seen 20 before. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, right, then, yeah. I'm curious to know. Your journey in terms of developing the model, uh, how long did it take? Uh, how big was the team? Did they have clinical background? Sure. But what I know is how Pell got looking for the last time, but it's not like the first time the clinical background. Okay, that's a, that's a good question. I think I'll just read the question. Uh, my, my journey, in, what's my journey in developing predictive models? Uh, to develop this kind of predictive model, you need three things. Okay, any kind of predictive model. Okay, first you must you need a lot of good data, relevant data. Second, you need um, a content of uh, content specialist. It means the person who knows the problem, who knows the data intimately. And third, you need a, a group of computing or statistical analysis uh, folks that are very good at working with this kind of data. And it's not just good at working with data. It's not just good at knowing the methods. But you know, a lot of people say that wow, this data analytics is so fashionable, you know, so clever, etc. But actually it's not, you know. Ninety percent of the time you are spending cleaning the data. Yeah, I'm a cleaner. <laughs> I'm just cleaning data all the time, making sure that what we put into the machine, right, is makes sense. Because you know, you all know about rubbish in rubbish out. The machine doesn't know what its it data is going in. You feed it rubbish, you come out with some rubbish, you know, answer for you. So you need to curate the data to a level where what you put in actually informs the machine of the correct factors that will allow you to use it. Right. Just to give an insight, that particular project took me about a year and a half. I have other projects that have taken me two or even three years. Um, the various teams I work with have given abilities. The clinical person is me. <laughs> um, the, the data scientists, I, I, got to know, I got to know them through collaborations, etc. Um, the biggest problem we had is communication. So half the time, right, I've been talking chicken and he's talking duck, right? <laughs> and all of all the time is he tells me something about principal component analysis, and I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and I tell him, look, appendicitis is the same as appendicitis. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's something that my, my medical student can tell him. Okay, but you know, because we have work in different fields. So we spend a lot of time ensuring that what we talk about is the same thing. So there it lies. Yeah. 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 Uh, this is a very important question. Is, that, is it possible to slow down or stop the transition from what we call pre-diabetes to diabetes, okay? Or even reverse the process? The answer is yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, just to, so that everybody know what pre-diabetes is, uh, it's based on a uh, particular blood test, the sugar, test, sugar blood test. So basically, we, we, we take your sugar before, we give you a drink of sugar, the known volume, sure. and then we take it later uh, in about two hours, right? And if your sugar goes up a little bit and comes back down, then we know that you're pre-diabetic. Because in a non-diabetic patient, your sugar should not even go up. Remember? Right. So that's the definition of pre-diabetes. Right. So the question is, can pre-diabetics pre um, be, pre be stopped from progressing to diabetes or even reversing it? But the answer is yes. 
And with the gentleman has asked the question earlier, which is a combination of diet, lifestyle, and diet, lifestyle, exercise will actually stop or completely reverse it. Yeah. So, in fact, that's the majority of our patients. Uh, we see them, we say, hey, you're pre diabetic. say, oh, really? Okay. Uh, I have to change my lifestyle. Yes. It goes away, I don't see them. <laughs> Okay. Which is good, which is good. Yeah. Any final Please, question? Most important, ah, you're yeah. a surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned laparoscopic surgery ah. as a like, almost permanent cure. Ah. So what are the attendant dangers of doing oh, it, besides okay. surgical dangers? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, the surgical dangers are not, okay, I must emphasize, first the surgical dangers of doing any kind of surgery is from between 1 to 2%. I think complications. complication. Okay. But the long-term dangers, related to that kind of surgery I was talking about, mainly related to malnutrition. In an ironic way, right, in doing that surgery, we actually need you malnourished. So we need to give you tablets to supplant your vitamins, your minerals. Uh, is it a big problem? It's taking tablets. Okay? Yeah. But it sure is better than uh, becoming diabetic. Okay? And I, I can tell you how dramatic it is. I had a patient, he's 36 years old. He's stage one kidney failure. He's diabetic for the last seven years. Very poor control. Uh, and he can't stop himself doing Chinese New Year eating everything. So I did the surgery for him. Within two weeks, his diabetes is gone. Within six months, his kidney is recovered. Okay, and he's lost about 25 kilos from 110. Right? Within one year, he has kept off his diabetes. His kidneys are perfectly better. His knees are better. He changed all his wardrobe. <laughs> Which is life changing. I mean, people don't realize it, but you know, once you lose that much weight, you gotta go shopping, right? <laughs> right? And and are the risks worth it for this patient? Yes, because if I left him on his trajectory, by the time he's fifty, I was telling him, look, you know, but in the next ten years, you're gonna get out of that, guaranteed, and your kidneys gonna fail in about five years. And he, he took it and he said, okay, I'll take this. Surgery. But surgery is not for everyone. For people who qualify for the, I think the weight and the diabetes. Yeah. Okay. Maybe one last question. Last question. Yeah. Uh, can I just ask, um, is there a breakdown in statistics by ethnicity here in Singapore? Yeah. Uh, there is. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to answer your question, I, I, I kind of reacted. <laughs> um, yeah. So by ethnicity, uh, the highest proportion of diabetics are actually the Malays. Okay. Followed by Indians, then the Chinese. And, and it's, it's, it's telling because just across the causeway, Malaysia has the highest rate by proportion of population of diabetics in the whole of Asia. China included, and India included. They have the highest proportion of diabetics, almost 27% of the population is diabetic. Can you imagine the scale of problem? Yeah, is there a root cause? Uh, no, nobody has very good because you see the difficulty of carrying out these kind of trials is that I need to chart you know, what you eat every day, how much exercise you take, you know, what's your family history like for thousands and thousands of patients mm -hmm. over a 10 year period. Beef run that could be the key. Sorry. Beef run that could be the key. Yeah. No, I, I was going to say, you know, <laughs> it's, it's up, you know, the group said, but, but it's very hard to quantify these kind of things. But we, we do see a trend in, uh, if you just break it down into energy rich foods by proportion. Yes. There is a clear, clear trend between energy dense foods and development of diabetes. One last one then. Thanks, <laughs> Doctor. The uh, quick one, I think maybe ready for the rest also. I have a family member who's diabetic. You know that if your parents have diabetes, chances of getting diabetes. They mentioned type 1 or type 2 was for 22%. Uh -huh. And if the grandparents have it, yes. so the parents don't have it, then you have the person who the third the by the chance for 3.5%. Yes. And then here you are with predictive analysis with data giving us certain precursors prior to the diabetes yeah. happening. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, any effort to put all this, we have a lot of stats. Okay. Put all this together and then uh, for some kind of diabetes management. So just okay. That's a very good question. I think the question is that is there a, a, a universal way to give people a predictive and, uh, tool to help them see whether they have diabetes? Now, the numbers we quoted came from studies done in the UK. Uh, we call the framework and half study, those numbers we quoted. So basically, they followed a group of people over 22 years. 
in the UK. And they looked at all their family histories, and etc. And based on that, cohort of patients, which was about 10,000 patients, they gave those numbers. So it's like a snapshot, like a picture. Okay? Um, what these kind of tools are new? Okay, why? Because they're not a snapshot. That means 10 years from now, they will tell you the same risk. Of course not, right? <laughs> the uh, people's uh, cultural norms have changed, diets have changed, etc. So the difference with what you quoted earlier and these tools is that these tools are dynamic. In the sense that the data keeps getting collected, the model keeps getting updated. So what I tell you this year may be a bit different 10 years from now. Right? Because the models have changed since then. But I, I think you're right that there should be a simple way to give you a, an answer as to what your risk is, given your difference. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a very urgent and important topic. And for an old guy like me, <coughs> my vintage, very proud of young man, I think. Because in Singapore, our school of medicine is among the oldest schools in the university. But for nearly half a century, it actually pretended that there was no need for any research. And I don't mean this in a bad way, but I know this is a criticism, but it's a fact. Dr. Nyan you know, belongs to a generation of young doctors from around the world who are prepared to collaborate, partner with each other, visit each other, talk to each other, communicate in spite of difficulties to make sure that at least there will be some hope for many of us as the years go along. And in two weeks, uh, <coughs> Dr. Nyan will be visiting the States again to try and forge new partnerships, new collaborations. And we wish him the best of luck because I think Singapore, even though we are small, we are pivotal in terms of boundary breaking areas of research. And we have the needs. And since we have the needs, we have the resources, I think it's good that we are doing it. And very proud that Dr. Nyan from here is doing it. So, again, yeah. thank you.